Oops. That's where you start. The title of today's workshop is Zen Debate. The subtitle is Nothing Without a Life. Now that sounds a little bit flippant and a little bit, oh, that sounds amusing, but what does it actually mean? Well, what it really means is that debating should not be seen as there is this position on the first half of government, and there is this position, and there is this position on the first half of opposition, and then another position for the second opposition team. The principle of Zen debating is that debating is a holistic activity. The debate happens as one cohesive whole, or should. So ultimately, you don't have to worry too much about what's being said by other teams in <coughs> terms of, does that stop me from saying something else? A lot of people think, well, I can't contradict what they've said. And that's true, you can't directly go against what other teams have said on your bench. You can't say what they said was wrong and what we're saying is right. But the principle of Zen, the principle of holistic debating, is to say, well, everything's interconnected. Everything can be looked at from a circular point of view. That's why I've got you all sitting like this. Because it's not just about clash from that side. If you imagine that the point of the debate, the fulcrum of the debate, is the centre of the circle, and the arguments can come from any radial tangent. The reason this is important, and this is what we'll get into when I start giving you the structure of this workshop, the reason this is important is that sometimes, and some of you may be aware of this after yesterday's debates, sometimes it becomes absolutely crucial for <laughs> teams on opposition, teams in the lower half of the debate, to know how to extricate themselves from what has gone before, to not get sucked in <coughs> to the swampy mire of a bad proposition. Because I think we've all been in debates, I certainly was in one yesterday, where a lack of clear definition from the first government made it very difficult for everybody subsequently. Did anybody else find that in the debate yesterday about assimilation? That a lack of clear definition of what assimilation was meant that the debate became very, very messy. Meant that there wasn't clearly defined clash in the debate, and ultimately meant that some judges had to demand alcohol from people by way of judge. Now that's not something judges like doing. We like to be given alcohol free with them. They don't want to have to demand haboos. But on occasions, it gets to that. And it's ultimately about the debaters as well, because nobody likes to be involved in a debate. Who felt good after the assimilation debate yesterday? Exactly. <laughs> Who felt happy with their own performance in that debate? Some people will. And some people will feel happy with their performance because they knew they were in a really <coughs> difficult position, that they had been put in a difficult position <coughs> and had done something to extricate themselves from it. What I hope to teach you today is how you can always do that. How when debate starts to go badly, it doesn't have to carry on that way. It's not like a dog that you've groomed in the wrong way. It's not about when good debates go bad. This is about making bad debates better. And ultimately, this is what the good teams do very well. And you're at competitions, particularly at big competitions like Worlds and at Euros, you'll always find a team that just misses the break and claims that they were shafted out of it. Oh, we got stuck in this horrible debate through the second government, there was nothing we could do. So we ended up taking a third. And that's why we missed the break. And I think, well, a good team doesn't get itself into that position. A good team knows how to get out of that position very, very quickly, but without causing tension in the government case or tension in the opposition case. So the first thing we're going to look at is, what can first government do wrong? Let's think of all the things that first government can do to make the debate a bad one a priori in the setup. The second thing we're going to look at is how each of those things might affect different teams in different ways. A bad setup by first government puts different problems in place in the first opposition, 
compared to the problems it gives the second opposition and the second government teams. So we're going to look at each of those problems in turn. Then we're going to move on to, well, what can we do to get away from it? What does opposition need to do, first of all? Because very often, first opposition are the ones who think, oh, I haven't prepared for this, and they flounder. Second government think, I can't contradict what's been said, even though it was somewhat less than clever. So they flounder. Second opposition then don't know where they're going with the rest of the debate. So we'll look again at what each of the individual teams can do. We'll also look at what happens when other teams contribute to the bad debate. Because that can sometimes happen. Generally, it shouldn't <coughs> happen. But I'll tell you a little story about killer robots that might illustrate the point. Yeah, killer robots. <laughs> OK, and then at the end, we're going to wrap up and make sure that we fully understand the holistic principles and why looking at debates in this context helps us not just to not get mired and bogged down in bad debate, but actually moves our debates along. It means that we're looking at bigger pictures. Because debate is always about a bigger picture. The more debating I do, the more I'm involved with it, the more I'm convinced that debating is not about disparate positions. It's about finding the common ground between the two teams. That's what really clever debaters do, really sophisticated providers of analysis. They don't say how we're different. They say, what are we both fighting for? What are we both trying to achieve? And that's where the holistic nature of debate comes to the fore. But let's go back right to the beginning. And let's look at first government. And the things that first government sometimes do, sometimes through no fault of their own, sometimes completely through their own fault, <coughs> that make for a bad setup. And you can use examples of debates you've been in, and I'll give you some examples of debates I've been in. And we'll examine the problems that those then create. So what does first government do that's wrong on occasion? Anyway. Yeah, bad definition. A squirrel? We'll talk about those separately. They're not always the same, but a bad definition. Terrible plan. A squirrel, a terrible plan. Absolutely. But they're not linking the arguments to the plan. No link between what they're saying and the motion. Anything else? It creates the situation in the position of management. Yeah. It tries to set up an unoperable debate. A truism, if you like. Or, another thing that might be unoperable, tautology, popping status quo, I don't need to <coughs> Any others? <coughs> Think of the debate you were in yesterday. Mm. A before. very vague plan. A very vague plan. So we're not really sure what's on the table. Absolutely right. Um, taking a position, stating a position that is typically contrary to what you'd want to have in this debate. Okay. Taking a contrarian position, something that is totally not what the debate's asking them to do. Why do governments sometimes do all these things? Is it just that they're malicious? No. They want to win. Most people want to win. So they're not doing it to make a bad debate, are they? But generally speaking, it's a lack of specific knowledge or it's a lack of understanding. Now that should never really happen. Let's look at the first one, though, bad definition. Bad definition could be we didn't understand the word. There was a word in the motion, an English word, that we'd never seen before. We didn't understand. It could be there was a word in the motion that we've seen before, but we misconstrued in this context. Or it could be a more deliberate bad definition, it could be something closer to a squirrel. I was once judging a debate where the motion before the House was that this House would allow trade in human organs. What's that debate really about? 
allowing someone to send a, sell a kidney? Yeah, selling your kidney is what that debate is going to be about. Is it okay or not? What are the integrity issues and things like that? What that debate isn't about is about prostitution. But think about it. Isn't prostitution trade in human organs? Yeah. It could be described as a form of trade in a form of human organ, but it's clearly not in the spirit of the motion. So that's a more knowing bad definition. It's more obvious. We've thought about we're going to squirrel this away and you won't be able to walk. Yeah. Um, if, it fits a, if it fits a motion like that and it's still to be able to round, um, is that still a bad definition? I would say that the first government team generally would be penalised because it's not in the spirit, the intended spirit of motion. But it's certainly debatable to say let's have a debate about legalised prostitution. Clearly debatable. But who is there more to be penalised? Is it not because of that or is it not being shipped to be trying to deny it? Um, we'll get we'll get onto that when we talk about what other teams can do. Um, but yeah, that's clear. It's, it's still a bad definition, even if it's something debatable. Even if it's something debatable, because ultimately, it's unfair on the other teams. It takes away their prep time, doesn't it? If everybody's prepped for something that they think is clearly intended by the motion, then first government go, oh, you got that one wrong. And first government are the ones who are wrong. Well, it's just unfair on the other team, surely. They haven't had a chance to spend 15 minutes thinking of cogent arguments to oppose the government's line or to extend the government's line. So we would penalise first or proposition or first government in those circumstances. What about the other things that we said a government can do? That a government can do badly, can do wrongly. Not just a bad definition, but truism or status quo props. <coughs> very, very difficult, particularly in British parliamentary debate, because what's the one thing you have to do in British parliamentary debate? Implement a change. You're going to change the status quo from something, do something. And some people stand up and go, well, we like the status quo. So we're going to defend the status quo. And that creates its own problems. But most of the things that a government does wrong is simply come down to a lack of understanding. And that generally shouldn't happen. Because we always say to teams, if you don't understand a word in the motion, come and ask us for clarification. And that's the first thing a government should do, or any team. You shouldn't, you can use dictionaries, language dictionaries, electronic dictionaries, things like that. But I wouldn't always rely on those, and I'll tell you about that why a little bit later. But you can rely on information from the adjudication team, from members of faculty to say, well, what assimilation means is X. Okay? We can't say, therefore, your argument should be along the lines of Y and Z, but we can give you a definition of a word. And one thing it's never legitimate in British parliamentary debating to do, and I know that in some formats this is allowed, is to take a word that has a clear definition in a dictionary and decide you're going to rewrite that definition for the purposes of this debate. You just can't do that. You don't get that luxury in British parliamentary debating. Who is most disadvantaged immediately by Bad definitions by truism props, by states of thought. Who's second? Who? Who? One at a time. Second government? First, first opposition? Second government? Second government? I'd say the immediate problem lies with the first opposition because they've got to speak first. They've got to speak, they've got seven minutes effectively to think about what they're going to do. And as happened in a lot of yesterday's debates, a lot of people didn't really understand the true meaning of assimilation. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Does assimilation mean the same as integration? No. Mm -hmm. Good. Got that. <laughs> Is assimilation a way 
of trying to achieve integration. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely right. What's another way of trying to achieve integration? Affirmative action policies. Affirmative action policies. Celebrating cultural diversity so that people can learn from each other because we know, or we think we know, that prejudice is born of fear and ignorance. So if we remove, remove the ignorance, we hope to remove the fear, and subsequently and consequently remove the prejudice. So if somebody stands up and says, by assimilation, we mean it's nice that people hang out together, what should first opposition do? Assimilation does not mean that. That's one thing they can do. But are they going to do that for seven minutes? Are they going to stand there for seven minutes and go, they haven't defined assimilation properly, therefore we do? <coughs> Does opposition win that debate? By doing that? <coughs> Argue on the grounds of what the first government did. They could accept first government's definition. They could say, we think it's wrong, but we'll accept it and we'll debate it. They can change it. They could redefine. That's an option open to them. Ultimately, assimilation is opposed in that debate to what? I've already said it. Yeah, affirmative action. Well, cultural diversity, it's, affirmative action is a policy within cultural diversity. It's not a principle. You don't have a principle of affirmative action unless you have cultural diversity. Because you don't need it. Okay? You don't need affirmative action in a mono-ethnic society. That's pretty clear. So let's get away from this term of affirmative action and stick with cultural diversity, simply because it makes the discussion easier. So when they say assimilation is we like people of different cultures hanging out together, they're actually running cultural diversity, aren't they? Rather than assimilation. So there's two options for the opposition. One is to challenge the definition and say, no, that's our argument, and then tell us why cultural diversity is good. And that's a perfectly legitimate tactic for the opposition to take. Does that create any clash if the first government had just told us why cultural diversity is good? It doesn't create any clash at all. Yeah, but that's, not, that's one line in the debate. Saying that's not assimilation, that's cultural diversity, and we also think it's a good thing. That there isn't a clash over what assimilation is, there's, but then, and there's also no clash over whether cultural diversity is desirable or not. So the, how, does, how does the judge then decide who's ahead in that debate, in terms of the actual arguments? You can't. There's no difference between the arguments. Because both the arguments are the same. Now in that instance, although it might seem odd for opposition, possibly the better tactic is to accept the flip. First government have effectively stood up and run the opposition line. Opposition, if they've prepared properly, should know the government line. If you know why you want to argue for cultural diversity and against assimilation, you should know also how to argue for assimilation and argue the common side of cultural diversity. So if you've had a government that proposes cultural diversity and tells you why it's good, tell the judges why it's not good. Tell the judges, okay, that's not what we were expecting, but the judges will know that anyway. You don't need to spend your time telling the judges that they've got the word assimilation wrong. Because that doesn't help anybody. That means that the team that were in fourth place, first government, are still in fourth place. And it also means that you've just guaranteed yourself a third in first opposition. Because the whole debate has still got to happen somewhere further down the table. And you don't want that. That's you getting sucked in. That's why bad definitions are like quicksand. Because if you stand on them too long, you start to sink into it as well. Okay? You don't want to spend all your time going, they were wrong, they were wrong to say this, they were wrong. That's not enough to win a debate. 
you need to take a more holistic approach. You need to think, well, this debate needs to have clash. It's our job to create clash. It's not your job to run cultural diversity if that's what everybody else is running. It's your job to create clash. So think outside the confines of, I'm opposing a particular motion, and think in a more zen fashion, I'm opposing whatever the government is saying. Yes? Well, then you just explain your argument, or what, what, do, what do you do then? But then you run the argument that you think should have come from the government. A good opposition team will have prepped that anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not a big stretch to say, because I've prepped the pros of cultural diversity, I should be aware of the cons of cultural diversity. So we basically like, okay, I'm going to now the government. Yeah, the you government. accept the flip. The team that's coming forth are still coming forth, but you've got a good chance now of winning that debate. Ultimately, then, it makes it much easier for the bottom half of the debate, doesn't it? From a holistic point of view, you've saved the rest of that debate for the judges. Because what does the bottom half do? Yeah, they follow up on you. Yeah, they follow the lines. Government runs cultural diversity. Opposition runs assimilation. There's no danger of knifing from either side. There's a small definitional problem, and we've dealt with it. Judge is happy. Look, happy judge. So, <laughs> this is the key that the judge is happy. You're trying to smile at you when you're doing things. And it's great. We actually think, thank God, first opposition we're here in that debate. Because they saw that the debate was about more than just this one definition. That a debate can still happen and they've saved everybody else from the quicksand. First opposition then get an awful lot of credit for accepting the flip doing a difficult job well, and helping out the other teams. In the judge's mind, OK, we don't write plus 15 points for saving the debate. But in the judge's mind, and the local will back me up on this, in the judge's mind, you are the saviors. We really, really like you, a priori, irrespective of how good your arguments are. We just like the fact that you were there right then. And that we didn't have to sit through the rest of what could have been an absolutely terrible day. So what happens when the second speaker comes up to power? Like if he uh, doesn't accept the clash or the clash of position, he already is just speaking with the story of the still. The second speaker of the first government hopefully will have prepped what his partner has prepped as a team writer. <laughs> if they haven't, then I don't think you want to be worrying too much about first government anyway. <laughs> if the first government team is that bad, my guess is you could stand up and go woo, 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 for seven minutes and still beat them. Uh, I mean, like, uh, you have the situation when you're actually you're realizing what you've done during the debate while you're the first government. Is there any way for the second speaker of the government to make a little bit if the, of If the opposition have accepted the flip, then the second government speaker has got to go with it. To try and flip it back then. <laughs> I've never ever committed murder during a debate, <laughs> but I think I might if that happens. Okay. And if they hate the judge and they, uh, you know, so basically they're going to do that and they know they're going to be for it. So, yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're even more than for it. Give them a minus point for detracting from the debate as a well. whole. And if you try to do second speaker, try to knife or <laughs> but they still, they still come from because they manage Yeah, I answer because it's not like it's something we did. We can only one stupid team that constantly do it as if we ever, everybody is doing it. Yes, yeah, yeah. We all, we all had a bit of this situation. Where we actually realized during the event that we had done, and we tried to fix it. If the second speaker thinks, oh, bugger, we got this wrong, we should be running a simulation and knifes his partner, and second speaker on opposition. Sticks with this part, you know, you started off with cultural diversity, we're running a simulation, you can't run the same as us because we're not then going to run cultural diversity for your benefit. Your city, sit down, we win. Which happens with the second government then? Well, second government carries on running cultural diversity because that's the line set by the, okay. the open government scheme. Yes? But what happens if they don't, if the second part opposition does, no, if the first opposition doesn't flip it? Ah. Then can the second... Right. That's, we'll get on to that later. Yeah. Um, in this debate, um, I had someone define assimilation as cultural diversity, but still argue for assimilation. For the um, true definition of assimilation. Well, yeah, yeah. So they, they didn't, 
So they actually argued for assimilation, but they're, they didn't match their definition. Okay. Um, I just, in that case, what counter death and engage in the clash. Yeah. Um, so it's just yeah. kind of like always go clash side. Yeah, absolutely. Always go with where the clash is, not where the correct dictionary definition is. Okay. You cannot guarantee that your judge has read a dictionary. Okay, that's the first principle. You cannot guarantee that your judge knows that it's an incorrect definition. So if they stand up and say assimilation is X and they've actually given a definition of cultural diversity, and then they argue something which wasn't their definition. They've argued assimilation, run from from diversity, okay. and say that's what your definition was in the first place, and we're happy to accept it, <coughs> and we'll tell you why it's a good thing. Yes, sir. But what, what should the first opposition do? Should they tell the judge that the definition was wrong and that they were flipping, or should they just keep their mouth shut and just no. flip? Say it. Let's say it in the first 20 seconds and then keep on saying it. You don't get any extra credit for reminding the judge that you've been in a difficult position and accepted the flip. Some people will do that, they'll say four or five times. And because we've had to flip, we're now going to say this point is the last point too. And because we've had to flip, we've now got to say this point. We know you flipped. We're aware of that. We saw the flip happen. We were in the room with you. Mention it so you make it clear that, to the judges that you're aware of it as well, and then don't mention it again. Don't keep going back to it, okay? The other thing, that government can do is prop status quo or a truism. Now, generally speaking, in British parliamentary debating, this is almost exactly the same as misdefinition. The effect is almost exactly the same. Why am I saying that? You just always go into the clash. Well, not just that, but what's, the, what's government's job? First government's job is to change something. So very often, the standard up line is defending the status quo, not changing anything. Yeah. If government then defend the status quo, that's exactly the same as running cultural diversity instead of assimilation. They're doing opposition's line. Defending the status quo is usually what the op will do. Or is it a, a line that's always open as well? So if they're defending the status quo, what should op do? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, you want to defend the status quo, we say the status quo isn't good enough, we want to change something. But do you do it under, uh, on the position of your line to make it even better, or do you implement something? Entirely up to you. But create a clash, change something. Say why the status quo isn't working, and say that we either need to go down what the motion was sent telling us to go down, or we can make the status quo even better by doing something else. That's entirely up to you. Yeah. So, <coughs> so the opposition should come up with a full proposal, or would it be better to just go on general stuff? Given that you've not had much time to think of an actual model, I don't think you want to try and make your model too involved. That's just a general rule of advice. I don't think models should ever be <coughs> so complex that they can be taking up sort of four or five minutes of the first person speech. Because then you're going to get into too many mechanistic difficulties. And you're also make, going to make for a pretty poor standard of debate. There's nothing worse in a debate than props standing up and saying, this is what we're going to do, and going in for really, really complicated mechanisms, and ops standing up going, we admire your principle, but you can't do this because it happens on a Tuesday, not on a Wednesday. You can't do this because the shoe size is 46 and not 44. <laughs> that is not a good debate. That's not great clash. That's not ideologies clashing. That's people <coughs> looking at threads to see if they can tear apart a whole jumper. It's not going to work. And judges are going to get very, very bored very quickly. You might do better than the first government in that case, but nobody's going to do well in terms of speakments and things like that. It's not going to be a good overall debate. So opposition again, needs to make sure it's creating clash by saying, look, this is what we want. Sometimes governments do both together. They misdefine and they end up propping the status quo. And that makes it much harder for opposition. Because if the status quo is a mix of a little bit of assimilation and a little bit of cultural diversity, and they misdefine one as the other, how do you clearly find a line of opposition? You 
the best way you can do that as an opposition is you take a step back from the debate so far. You think, okay, we've heard a lot, but does any of it really address what the debate's actually about? Remember that first question you asked yourself when you saw that motion? What is this debate really about? What is this debate asking us to do? Has any of what they've said actually addressed that? And I hope you don't mind me, Don, using your prop as an example. But we had a definition yesterday. But assimilation meant people of different cultures hanging out together. And we think this should happen at university because we think it's a good thing. Well, it does. And at universities are possibly the most integrated environments you can find in multicultural societies. Because people at university tend to be more tolerant of different ideas and different cultures and different backgrounds. It's very, very difficult for Alt to say, A, that it shouldn't happen, or B, that we should make it happen more. <coughs> but does anything in the government's argument say that this furthers integration in the wider society? That this reduces racial tension in society? Because that's the other thing that that debate's asking you about. When it says we would assimilate culturally and racially, it says the unwritten bit of the motion is as a way of removing racial tensions from our society. Okay? So when you've got that kind of government position, what Ock can do is literally, not just figuratively, but literally take a step back. <coughs> and I've seen speakers do it and go, okay, we need to take a step back from this. And it sounds stupid to do it, but it works very effectively. The judge's mind are like, wow, that's emotional <laughs> distance. I like that. And they say, Mr. Speaker, what this debate is ultimately about is how best we develop a multi-ethnic society. The common ground in this debate, and this is the holistic approach, the Zen approach, the common ground in this debate is or should be how do we achieve a society without racial tension, without racial division, without the potential to conflict. What we've heard from government is all very true, and we're happy to concede it all. We think people hanging out together is a good thing. Yes, well done government. We think it happening at universities is probably a good idea, because it does. We don't see how any of that furthers the overall integration of society. And that's what we really want to talk about. You can just forget what the first government has said. You are setting up clash for the rest of the debate, rather than creating clash with a team that it's difficult to clash with. So as I said, they, we also said when they run truistic definitions, when they try to create a situation that's unopposable, that's what you can do. If it's unopposable, it's probably not going to be as close as they think to the spirit of emotion. Because emotions are set so that they can be opposed. When we set motions, we don't think, oh, this is a really good one for government to propose. Because that's not a good motion. I personally, when I go to motion setting days or the tournaments I run at various universities, I go down and I meet with all the officers of their debating society and we spend a day running the motions in our heads. Somebody says, I want to run a motion in this house for X, Y, and Z. And I say, OK, what are the eight speeches you want to hear? Tell me. Because if you can't tell me now, I'm not going to ask debaters to provide them later. So we think about possible lines of opposition in government for the motions when we set them. So there should always be a way of creating clash. And if your first opposition, there's nothing at all you can legitimately clash with from the first government, that's a way you can do it. Take a step back and say, this debate is really about achieving this. That's the ground that both sides want. When we talk about clash in terms of political ideology in democracies, not in debate, but in democracies, let's look at Britain as an example. Do Labour and Britain and the Conservatives both want the same thing ultimately for Britain? Do they both want a happy society that's successful, that develops economically, and that is defendable? Yes. Everybody does. You'd be a moron to stand for election in a country and go, I'm going to stand on a platform of economic stagnation, insecure borders, no employment, and no welfare. Nobody's going to vote for you. 
So there's always that common ground that you're both trying to achieve in the debate as well. And if first opposition can identify the common ground, they can set up the clash for the rest of the debate. Again, in the judge's eyes, you're going to get an awful lot of credit for having done what you did. Okay? So that's first opposition. That's how they can respond. Sometimes, first opposition don't do that. Sometimes first opposition go, oh, quicksand. And rather than hauling themselves out of the quicksand, they grab onto the nearest thing which tends to be the second government's legs. You start to pull them in as well. Because first opposition can go, yep, cultural diversity, good. Happening at university, good. We agree. With everything. We don't think we need to clash with you ideologically because you've argued our line, therefore we should win. What does second government do then? The second government can't change the government line, yet if they don't change government's line, are they clashing with the opposition? No. No. They're not, are they? So this is where government needs to knife. But you need to do it without a knife. And that's quite difficult. I don't know if you've ever tried to cut a piece of steak with a wooden spoon. It's not very easy to do. The reason I call this knifing without knifing, has anybody ever seen a film called Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee? Where he goes to a tournament on an island run by Mr. Hun. Yeah. yeah? And he's on a boat going over there. And there's this New Zealander who's always kicking the kids on the boat to show how tough he is. Bruce Lee's very quiet, he's very zen. This guy starts throwing air punches at him to try and distract him. And Bruce Lee looks at him and says, so what's your style then? What's your style of fighting? Bruce Lee very calmly says, I call it the art of fighting without fighting. And the guy's intrigued and says, fighting without fighting? How do you do that? And Bruce says, oh, I'm not sure you, but there's no space here. And the guy goes, well, where can we go? And he says, how about that? That island. How are we going to get there? We can take this boat. OK, after you. So he lets this guy get into this little junk boat that's trailing behind the big ship they're on. <coughs> and then he calls over one of our deckhands, the lads that this guy's been beating up. And he hands him the rope to the junk boat and just starts feeding it out. <laughs> because his objective wasn't to have a fight with this guy and give away all his secrets before a big tournament. His objective was to get the guy out of his face and off the boat. And to stop him beating up the deckhands. That was his point in fighting. But if you can achieve that without fighting, that's much more effective. He <coughs> just feeds it out, and the guy's stuck in a little boat, Bruce Lee wins. Fighting without fighting. So when we're knifing without knifing, we need to make it clear to judges that what we think proposition have done isn't a good thing. Equally, we need to make it clear that what we think opposition have done isn't the right thing either. It's very, very difficult to do that without stabbing somebody somewhere. Not literally. Remember this, right? This is all <coughs> metaphorical stuff. <coughs> but there are ways and means you can do it. Some of them are quite simplistic and they're quite obvious to judges when they're doing that. I heard somebody do it in this academy, I can't remember when, where somebody stood up and sat off the table and said, we don't need to talk about first government's model. We think it can be judged on its own merits. That's quite a loaded statement. We think it can be judged on its own merits. That's a good tactic if the only problem with government is the ridiculous model that they've given, but they've got all the principled stuff right. But that's not really what we're talking about, because as a second government, you should never really need to defend the model anyway. That's not your problem. Second government should be all about principles. Anyway. So again, you can just simply say, Mr. Speaker, what the debate is really about. It's about the principles that underpin the government's model. And you don't need to mention the government's model at all. That's very effective. You've tacitly said, you've implicitly said, their model is shit. Their model does not work. You've also said, we're part of the government line, and we have this collective responsibility. 
It's a doctrine we have in the UK for cabinet. You can't come out of cabinet and say, I disagree with cabinet's decision. Everybody in cabinet makes that decision. But you've implicitly said, we recognise that their model was not the greatest in the world. And that's fine. But that's an easy one to get out of. And very rarely is that even seen anywhere near enough, because you should be running on principles in the second half of the table anyway, most of the time. And if you think of division most of the time, the first half is going to deal with practicalities and models. Second half will have more of the wider, broader principles. That's what effective extension is, ultimately, is broadening the debate out to that sort of level. But when you've got a problem with government that isn't just about the model, is it enough to stand up and say, we don't need to talk about what the government, first government said, they can be judged on their own merits. Does it mean anything? We're always going to judge each team on its own merits. That's why we're there to judge. That's why you're split into four teams and not into two. So telling the judges that isn't really helping them at all. So what should a good second government team do if the first opposition team hasn't been able to set up the right sort of clash for the lower half? How does the second government go about doing it? Well, is it similar to the first opposition, just taking, uh, take one step back, set uh, the whole field of yeah. one principle? So that's, that's absolutely the right answer. Do what I've just said first opposition should do. Well, answer the question. This debate is ultimately about how we achieve X. We think X is achieved in this way. Now it's difficult when both sides have run the same thing. If they both run cultural diversity, second government can't say X is achieved with cultural diversity or X is achieved with assimilation. <coughs> but would that be an extension anyway of the debate? Or would it just be a rehash of what both sides on the first half have said? <laughs> I think a cleverer line for the second government is to tell me why X is a desirable end in itself. Tell us why integration is desirable. Put a burden on opposition to tell me that integrated societies are a bad thing. It can be done. It certainly can be done. But again, it's taking a very holistic view of the debate as a whole. This House believes in cultural and integration assimilation, unwritten bit of the motion, to enhance integration to prevent further integration tensions. Say why? That is a desirable end in itself. Move the debate away from narrow distinctions or non-distinctions between cultural diversity and assimilation. Don't even talk about cultural diversity and assimilation. You don't talk about assimilation. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's possible to win a debate, a bad debate, about Turkey's entry into the EU without ever mentioning Turkey, the EU, or the word obsession. From second government. If you've had a bad first half, people who don't know what Turkey is, people who don't know what the EU is, people who don't know what obsession is, and all are equally bad, you can still win that debate not using those three words. How? You show why. Accepting new members into a community is a good thing. Yeah. You say, A, why expanding communities is a good idea, because it's about an exportation of value. You say, B, why international relations are always improved by bringing people in rather than excluding them. You run a standard inclusion versus exclusion dichotomy. How do you get best, best get somebody to do something you want them to do? Do you do it by putting an arm around them and saying, come on, you can do this? Or do you do it by waving a big stick at them and saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to beat you? Both arguments are valid. Both arguments are valid. Kissinger would say one leads to the other. Does everyone know the Henry Kissinger quotes about diplomacy? Diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy until you can find a large enough stick. Kissinger would say you start off by putting your arm around and going, oh, come on, you can do this. And then when they refuse, going, we're going to beat you. That's usually the way it works for children. <laughs>
You try a carrot first, and if it doesn't work, you get them with a stick. Not literally. So you can move the debate onto a different principled level about inclusion and exclusion, and not about Turkey and the EU, or free trade area agreements, or clash of cultural values between mainly Judeo-Christian democracies and a largely Islamic population. You don't have to get into that discussion. That's the quicksand that you're trying to avoid. What you want to be doing whilst you're watching people in the quicksand is building yourself something that doesn't sink. Almost like the principle of snowshoes. If you find any snowshoes, you can go walking on that quicksand and it doesn't affect you. Okay? But you can only do that if from the very first moment you've started prepping, you've had a very holistic view of what that debate is about as a whole. If a second government, and occasionally this happens, if a second government don't do that or are unable to do that because they don't have a Z approach, they don't have a holistic approach to the debate, they might think, well, I've just got to make the cultural diversity arguments better than all four speakers before me. They may be able to do that. They may be able to provide such sophisticated analysis of cultural diversity is good, that they put themselves ahead of the other two teams. Is it likely, if all four speeches have been about why cultural diversity is good, that there's going to be much they can expand on? It's not. So it's a very slim chance that the second government are going to do anything good like that. If they try to do that, what does opposition do? Because every team, so far, is running cultural diversity is good. What does second opposition do? They stand up and go, assimilation! That's what the motion said. Do they? That would be the surest way of making sure first government suddenly weren't fourth in this debate. By standing up as the only team in the debate and going, we like assimilation, actually. We disagree with you, 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 and you. And probably the judge as well. That's not going to help, is it? So what could a second opposition team do? Exit the room. Run! Run like when you run, Forrest! Again, surest way of not giving first government the fall. Just get up and leave the debate. Do you step back then? They have to take several steps back. <laughs> they've got to take so many steps back, they've got to shout just to reach the podium. <laughs> They've got to get so far away from this quicksand and put up big signs around it saying, watch out, quicksand. <laughs> but they've also got to tell the judge, dear judge, we know you've been through hell. <laughs> and we're here like Orpheus in the underworld to lead you back. Okay? We're here to show you that there was actually a debate here. We're here to tell you what that debate was. And we're here to tell you why, as the only team that understands that, you should be really kind to us and let us win. <laughs> okay? 